I have used Docker for years, and in that time, I think I've made every boneheaded mistake you can think of. My goal for this video is to enable you to get around a Dockerized Nux3 application. I've already Dockerized the application. I'm going to show you how I did it. I'm going to show you how to use it. And I hope by the end of this video, you feel comfortable using Docker with a Nux3 application. Let's jump into it. Whenever you're beginning to work on a project that has already been Dockerized, the very first place you should go is the Docker Compose file. That is going to show you all of the different services that are available to you. So for example, Example. In this project, we have a Nginx reverse proxy server. Now these services can be named whatever you want, but it makes sense to name something that is recognizable to everybody. In this particular application, Avantage is the name of the application. So to say that it runs in Avantage makes sense. We could also name this node, but in this case, I went with the name of the application. So we have an Nginx reverse proxy. We have a database container, and we also have the node container. Within those services, you'll notice that we use an image for the Nginx container. You can either build your own image with a Docker file, which we will see down here, or you can use a standard image. So a official image from Docker Hub. This has been downloaded a billion times. That is insane. You know you can trust them when they are an official image. Other images, there are plenty of trustworthy images out there, but just know that if it's not official, you are taking at least a slight risk because you're not sure, exactly sure what they packed into that other image. If you click through on in VS Code, you'll go straight to, I just pushed command click and I went straight to the official documentation and there you can find everything you'll ever need to know. So let's see, we have our image, which is a standard image. Make sure that you always use versioning because if something updates and your application isn't ready for it, then things might break, especially if you're using it in production. Locally, it's not such a big deal, but if you're using it in production, make sure you actually tag the version. Then the working directory. When we go into the container in just a moment, you're going to see this is where we land if we go into the Nux container on the command line. Then we have our ports. I want you to remember this mnemonic, beat it into your head, don't forget it. I've forgotten, I think a thousand times, I said in the beginning, I have made all the boneheaded mistakes. I forgot a bunch of times which side of this colon has which port. So one of these sides is the outside world. The other side is the container. And the way that I remember it now is right in, left out. You better go right in or you're gonna be left out. So right is into the container, left is outside of the container. So this is on our local machine. This is inside of the container. Go right in or you're gonna be left out. Don't forget that. Now we have our volumes. Volumes in this particular instance, it's just a mapping from right here. It's a relative map so that we can have this directory and everything inside of it mapped to this directory within the container. So when I go into the container here, and if I go to this path, I'm going to see an Avantage folder and everything inside of it. We'll do that in just a second. Also, we have a bunch of config stuff listed inside of here. We won't go into app into great detail about the config. I will fly over it for you in a moment but just getting the, the general feel of how these containers are built. So we have the image and we have our ports and we have our volumes. And that is true for each one of these services. So this one also uses the main image, the official image. We've mapped out the ports here as well so that we could call the container from the outside. You don't necessarily have to do that, but if you wanna be able to use a some sort of database uh, service, then you'll want to map that port out as well. Also, you can put environment vi variables within the Docker Compose file. And these environment variables are taken from here, just like normal. And we use something that looks a lot like template literals from JavaScript to say, hey, this is a variable. Also, we can do something called a named volume. Now this volume you'll notice is not relative. It also doesn't look like a path at all. That's because it's not. It does end up mapping to a path somewhere on your computer, which is a very long, long path that you don't really need to memorize or know. So you don't tell Docker where to put it. 
depending on what operating system you're working on, Docker will put it in a special place where it keeps all of its named volumes. It's not something you really need to concern yourself with. You will never really interact with the named volumes directly. Lastly, we have our node container or our node application, and I've named it the same as the application. We could also call this node and refer to it like that everywhere. That would be fine as well, but I've chosen to name it this way. You could set a user on your container. You could actually set a user on each of these containers, but I didn't do that. If you log in default, it will be root. And that is sometimes useful, especially if you're creating files and things like that. If you want them to be created with a certain user because of permissions, you can also name a user on the container. They actually recommend that you never use root on the um, containers. In my experience, it's not so much of a problem. If someone is far enough that they can get onto your container, I think you've got other problems. Now, the build. And these particular ones, you'll notice we don't have a build. That's because we're running the official image. But here, we're actually going to build our image. Now, you build usually from a certain image. Now, let's go here. So, config avantage. If we go into config avantage, you'll notice we have a Docker file. And you list here the name of the Docker file. And then the context is just the path to that file. So, I will open up that Docker file. Notice we have from up top. And if I click through to here, you guessed it right, we go to the official image. It is always a good idea to go from the official images. You don't have to. If there's an image that has a bunch of stuff that you want, then go ahead and use it. But I typically go from the official image and then I start building on top of that. Now here, we've set some environment variables directly in the Docker file. And the reason for that is, is we wanna make sure Nuxt is running on the port and host that we expect. Uh, this may not be necessary. I know it was when I built this, but if you need to set those in the environment, you can do that also directly in the Docker file. And then we again have our working directory, which means every command that we write, it will assume this directory unless we pass the directory along with it. So let's actually see this container in action. All right, I think we've gone much too long without actually seeing these containers in action. So let's get it running. If we type Docker compose up, it will start our containers. Now I've done compose up because I want you to actually see what's going on. Typically, you would do a minus D here so that it runs detached in the background, but I actually want to see what's going on here. So we'll see we've started our services, MySQL and Avantage, the Mailhog server. And then here, you'll notice that looks very familiar. That is Nuxt 3 running. And if we go to localhost 3000, we'll be met with a little bit of a surprise if you don't know why it's not working, I'm going to tell you right now. It's because we have not mapped port 3000 out. There's a reason we haven't mapped it out, and I'll show you in just a second. But if you go and you see this port, port 80, port 443, 3306, all of these ports, none of them are port 3000. This application is running on port 3000, but it's running inside of the container environment, not outside. And if you don't map it, the outside will not be able to connect with it. So if I go to regular localhost, we will see that the application is actually running. And why was I able to connect with it on localhost? Well, the reason is, is because this Nginx has mapped port 80 out and port 443. And if we go into the config here, we will see, so sorry, config Nginx, and we go into sites dev, we will see, well, it popped up exactly right where I wanted it, that it is mapped. So port 80 is listening. And so any directory, so that says any location from the root will be proxy passed to this Avantage service. Notice this matches this. We interact with other services within our network. So inside, they're all on the same network because I did not list a network here. That means they're all on a default network, which means they all see each other. From container to container, they see each other. They just can't be interacted with from the outside world unless the port is open. But they can all see each other within that um, network. And when they talk to each other, they need to call each other by name. And this service's name is Avantage. And so we have Avantage here and port 3000. 
That is why on my local machine, when I go to localhost, it's actually being mapped in the background in the container to port 3000. So let's actually see this in action. One more thing, actually, before I show you uh, other things working, I'd like to show you that I can go to my.avantage.dev and it's also working. That's because I have set up on my local machine on in the slash etc slash hosts, you can map any valid URL to your local host. I've also created, which I won't go deep into because it's boring as hell. I've created some SSL certificates. And then I trusted those certificates on my machine. If you would like me to dive into that, let me know in the comments and we can go really, really deep into it. But I will just fly over that. It's not rocket science to make an SSL certificate. And it's all you got to do is double click it, trust it. That's pretty simple. But if you want me to go re much deeper than this, let me know what kind of level you guys are looking for. That is how I can interact with this using this URL. So let's actually see this a little bit in action. I'll log out. Let me log in again. And if I log in, let's go to dark mode. What am I doing? Um, if I log in again, or sorry, register, actually, we will see a one-time password was sent and, I'm sh and I should verify my email. Now, if I go to localhost 8025, already in my list, we'll see I got this email. And you might be asking yourself, wait a minute, where did this mail hall come from? I didn't see it. Well, we are actually running more than one Docker Compose file. You didn't see that in the beginning because I want to warm you up a little bit. We can actually run more than one Docker Compose file at a time. And the way that we're doing that here is in this ENV file, we say which Docker Compose files should be running. And you'll notice we have an extra file here. I'll open that up in a second. But what I want to drive home to you right now is whatever is on the right will either add to or overwrite what it's on his left. So from the left, it has the least amount of rank, we could say. The right has priority. So the right will always overwrite or add to what's on its left. So in one particular case, Avantage, here is what you would run in production, but we know we want hot module reloading in development. So if I go to, let's go to an example. Um, let's go to the app info page. So it's slash info. If I change something at slash info, um, current application, hey, and then I save, I expect current application to have hey after it, which it does. I had to refresh, but it does have it there right away. That's because it is reloading. But in the production environment, there's maybe a bunch of other reasons for it, but essentially you don't want to be running a dev command in production, but you do want to be running it in your dev environment. So that is why we have overwritten that command here to use yarn dev. So that is one command being overwritten by another. Notice we didn't have to list all of the other stuff on the container here, only what we want to overwrite. Also, notice this brand new container that we didn't have at all in the main Docker Compose. That's because we only want to catch emails on our local environment, obviously. When we're live, we want to send real emails. But on in the local environment and perhaps on your integration environment, you would want to have this mail hawk set up so we can use it just like we have. Now, I hope I've driven home that point for you. If you want to use Docker in multiple environments, it makes sense to separate things into separate Docker Compose files. Now let's get our hands dirty on the command line. Hey, if you wanna see more content like this, don't forget to subscribe. First, I wanna show you that I have set up a few aliases because I am lazy and I suck at typing. So I've set up the aliases. If I want to run just Docker Compose, I can write DC. If I run Docker Compose up, I can write DCU, DCD for Docker Compose down. And if I want to restart all the containers, I've mapped that into one thing. If you see me typing in one of these commands, you'll know what they are. So now every time you see DC, think Docker Compose. So Docker Compose exec, uh, the name of the service and bash. Now, as I alluded to before, everything in here is the same as everything in here. Those are the same. Now, I'll prove that to you. So I'm inside of the container, and I'm going to do touch hello. And you'll see hello pop up out here. That's because it's a one-to-one -one mapping. And if I rename that here, 
So I want to call it actually hello dot or let's go with a dot JS. So if I run or if I call it now hello dot JS, we'll see it is instantly mapped out here. So that is proving to you that those are. So if you ever so you're setting up your own um, project and you've created a Docker file, you go in and you see, oh, wait a minute. I expected all the files to be here, but they're not there. Where are they? Well, you've probably mapped it incorrectly, which I've done no less than 5,000 times. So if you map things incorrectly, here is a very simple setup. But if we have like a project that has, you know, five or six different applications in one, which is not untypical. If you have like five or six different applications, tons of different directories uh, being mapped, different paths to different places, you're eventually going to get it wrong. And when you do, just remember the computer knows what path you gave it and it's not doing it wrong. It's definitely you, not the computer. I've had this problem many times. So make sure you pay attention to the mappings. The path that you give it is the path it will map it to. All right, I beat that horse to death. So let's see what else can we do in this container. I can write npx um, Prisma Studio, for example, and it's running on localhost 5555. Oh, snap, it's not working. Why is it not working? Now I have the port mapped. Oh, it looks like someone came in the background and changed the port. Maybe they had a port conflict and they changed it and then they committed it. Or I just did it in the background so that I could say this. But, but either way. So 5555 has been mapped to 5454. That's why we can't reach it. So let's see what happens if we go to port 5454. Oh, we have Prisma Studio. Isn't that awesome? Well, and we can obviously use it just like as if it were on our local machine. Um, that's another thing that I wanted to get into is you would not really want to have to log into the container every time to run something like Prisma Studio. That would be a pain in the ass. So instead, it's good to create a bin file for such things. And if we go to bin, we see we have NPX out here. Very cool. We also have Prisma out here. But let's just look at NPX. If we go here, we'll see that it's running Docker Compose and it's already going into our correct service, which is Avantage. And then here is how you say whatever comes next. So you put it in um, parentheses, or sorry, not parentheses in quotations. And then you give a dollar at symbol and in bash, that means if I run bin NPX Prisma Studio, it's going to tell me denied because I need to give that permission. I need to say ch mod and then plus X, and then go to bin NPX. And now when I run that second time, we'll see it's green and I can run Prisma Studio and we'll see it's running on the host. And if I refresh, we'll see it's still running. If I get rid of it, not running, run it again, running. So we can see we can actually interact inside of the container a little easier by setting up bin commands. Now, if you didn't want to write npx prisma and you just wanted to write prisma, for example, then you could make it even easier and then set up the command to be even more lazy. I recommend the lazier, the better. The less you have to write, the better. So instead of npx prisma, you can just write bin prisma. We can run it like that. Now, if you want to dive into every single aspect of this setup, let me know in the comments below. I hope that I've given you a good overview of how to use Docker and Docker Compose in a Nuxt application, what it looks like to set it up. If you want to go into more detail on your own, you can check out the repository. I'll list it in the comments. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one.